He's working with Aflatech EX, and he has been working on the Skyboard program to build a data pipeline that is a bit more efficient and useful than the one we have currently. That's the plan, at least. That's the plan. And he's been killing it from everything I've been hearing. Well, you know, the the rumors of my achievement have been greatly exaggerated and all that. Yeah, uh, oh, I'll let you do that. So as soon as we get the slides up here, Mr. Alex Marburg. In this awesome. person, you'll have minutes, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I guess the only additional information about myself that I'd say is that uh, I, got a, I have a BS in mechanical engineering, but we all know what that stands for. So it's, we'll uh, <laughs> just move on from that. All right. Uh, so this is a Skyborg data analysis, a vault approach. Uh, I'll be talking briefly about, uh, well, it's going to be too brief. <laughs> about the work I did to support the Skyboard project using uh, the Air Force vault environment. Uh, on the first slide here, we'll have a little bit of a uh, overview, kind of give you guys an idea of what we'll be talking about. Uh, the first couple slides will be informational, to catch everyone up to speed about what you know Skyborg is. You may not be familiar with it, what uh, the vault environment is. Sure, that's not a very familiar term for most of us as well. And then finally, we'll get into what I've actually done to support this project and kind of uh, a, a uh, early look at some of the products that I produced. First of all, we'll talk about Skyborg. Um, it is currently a pre-programmer record that I'm uh, helping to transition into a full programmer record. Uh, supposedly, it's going to happen soon, but we all know what soon means. Uh, so Skyboard is uh, the goal of it is to have several autonomous aircraft that will be controlled by a pilot and they will serve a loyal wingman role. So essentially what that means is uh, there'll be a single human pilot and he'll have a squadron of uh, attritable aircraft that will uh, follow commands and perform maneuvers that will be, you know, uh, more dangerous or in a position where we wouldn't want to put human pilots, if we can help it. Uh, so, and we are currently pursuing this by experimenting with uh, several different host platforms as well as autonomous systems. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit, uh, I will talk a little bit about that later as we go, but um, this is kind of the, I think there's a laser pointer on here. Thought. Nice. So we're, uh, the intended environment for the Skyboard platform is in this contested, attritable aircraft environment. Like I said previously, it's to kind of be a buffer between the actual human pilots and what we'll be sending them at. So here are some of the Skyboard test objectives. Um, first and foremost, we would like to characterize the error between command and response. We really wanna know what these autonomous systems are capable of and whether or not they can stand up to our standards of, we want you, uh, we command you to do X, are you doing X within reason? <laughs> Sometimes that's a little bit more uh, hopeful than realistic, but it's free program and records, so there's time to grow. Uh, we'd also like to just demonstrate some autonomous capabilities, share data other than through physical transport. Uh, I know from personal experience that when you're waiting on someone to physically upload your information, it can be kind of a uh, long and uh, nervous process while you're waiting for things to be in a position where you can use them. And then finally, the one that I've been working on personally, and the one that's most uh, relatable to me personally, is to just have it so that all these tools can be in the same place, usable by multiple people, and so that we just, you know, don't have to build the same wheel every, every other time that someone comes into the project. So here's, uh, here's some images of the various host platforms that Skyborg is being uh, tested on. Um, the UTAP-22, XQ, uh, sorry, XQ-58, the X-62 Vista, and the M-220. All of these platforms are currently being tested. Um, I would like to point out that the XQ-58 
uh, sorry, I keep saying the wrong one. The X62 Vista is a little bit different in that it is a uh, somewhat of a hybrid approach where it has uh, the ability to hold, uh, sorry, host a human pilot in addition to the autonomous system with the human pilot being able to, you know, manually engage or disengage as needed. So that's, that's kind of nifty in my opinion, at least. So uh, as with all things that we, uh, we all work with, uh, we have information. So the Skyborg information that I uh, am working with comes from several different data sources. Whether that's the planned event, uh, the actual recorded data from the host platform or uh, plane, uh, whether that, that that would be like tele telemetry, altitude, latitude, all the good tudes. Uh, the AI system, what it believes it's doing, and that's that's really important uh, because sometimes it thinks it's doing something correctly and it's not really doing exactly what we want, but that's good to know regardless. Um, and then the physical performance as uh, radar and all the other sensors that we have out in the field to give us a real good idea of where, what, and how the platform is performing in a test environment. Uh, and then I'm going to give you all a brief intro into what Vault is. I've used that word a couple times, but uh, I figure it'd be good to give a little bit of an explanation. So Vault stands for, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to read this off, uh, Visible Accessible understandable linked and trusted data platform. So uh, the purpose of Vault is to host a variety of uh, sy uh, systems in a uh, single environment that will have, uh, it's, uh, it basically has a bunch of apps that you can use that's in a environment that is uh, CAC enabled. And by that, I mean a uh, common access card. So as long as you are a you know individual who has a common access card, you can request access to this environment with all the tools that are within it. And uh, it all, it's also uh, cloud-based. So that means that uh, if you are uh, let into this environment, you have access to all of these uh, wonderful tools that live within it. And it's, uh, it's growing. And uh, one of the more recent additions was uh, is a GitHub environment from my understanding, which I recently started using because, you know, it's helpful for my programs. <laughs> um, now I'm gonna kind of walk you through an engineer level <laughs> understanding of what I'm doing. It's uh, it's pictures, which is the format that I'm the most comfortable understanding personally. <laughs> so first we have the test flight data and we collect that, you know, as we mentioned previously from all the different sensors and systems. So we essentially get the data. It's all in a bunch of different formats and forms. Uh, it's the data that's collected onto a closed network. So it's cleaned up a little bit so that it could be sent off to people that are in the <laughs> in a dip in in a different network right that is uploaded into the vault environment through the uh, hue and I'll talk a little bit more about hue in a minute uh, once it's uploaded into this cloud based uh, data storage environment uh, I pull it down into databricks um, some of you may be familiar with Databricks, and I will explain a little bit more about it in a minute. But uh, to, uh, the, the, the long and the short of it is that it's essentially just a um, Jupyter Notebook-like coding environment that uses Python as well as a uh, couple other programming languages. So it's, uh, it's very beginner friendly, let's just say. Question. Oh, uh, yes. I don't know if you have a question at the end or in the middle. We can do now. Apotech U, is that inside the vault or outside the vault? Uh, yes, it, uh, the Apotech U is inside the vault. Um, you can, my, my expertly uh, drawn image here, all these systems are living within the vault. So, is the vault a programmer record? Uh, no, I'd say. Uh, Who controls vault? Right now, the Air Force. Uh, CDAO. 
Okay. Thank you for your question. Um, once the once the information is pulled into the when, once I pull the information into Databricks, I go through the long and tedious process of reformatting it, making sure that everything matches the way that I've <laughs> that I need it to work with everything I've already built. Uh, once that information is basically all formatted, cleaned, and then um, combined into a single document, uh, I save it as a CSV file, and then I upload it back into the queue so that I can access it later. Uh, once the uh, cleaned and formatted information is uh, saved back up into the queue, I can pull down that edited data source into a Plotly dash dashboard environment. And so essentially what that is, and I'll have a little bit of a demonstration later, uh, is it's a um, coding environment that is keyed towards building uh, dashboards for decision makers or whoever needs to look at the information in a way that's readable to someone who hasn't been staring at raw data for longer than they'd like to admit. So uh, I'm gonna be, this is a, well, honest. So I had actual code on these slides and I, to, I was told I can't do that. So I have uh, just the uh, screenshots from the, from the main pages of these websites. Uh, so Hugh in this uh, left-hand corner is a open source SQL assistant. Uh, for queryable databases, data warehouses, and collaborating. So essentially, it's a cloud-based storage environment that I am using to post all my information so that I can find it later. Uh, I, I mentioned previously that Databricks is a, a Jupyter notebook-like coding environment. It The other thing that it really does well is it's... Uh, for being in the vault and being uh, in the cloud, it is a uh, collaboratively accessible uh, tool. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that uh, when you build a product in the vault using Databricks or some of the other uh, applications, anyone who has access to that environment can come into your network if you give them permission and they can live real time make edits to your documents without having to be in the room with you or having to make a copy on their own machine. And so that's one of the real great uses of uh, the Vault and Databricks in my opinion. So here's an early representation of the dashboard that I designed. Um, I will say I, I'm an engineer. <laughs> I'm not a. I'm not real good at making things too pretty. Uh, but um, in the top left corner, there is a drop-down menu that allows the user to select which segment of the test event they would like to uh, basically have a closer look at at uh, at that point in time. Uh, it'll update all the graphs as shown below, um, and it gives uh, some some useful information. Uh, the second drop down is uh, select a feature to display. So it's currently set up so that when you select that and you choose altitude, latitude, all those good things, it'll update the graph so that it shows you a representation of that information. Uh, oh, okay, thank you. Um, and then the final graph that's kind of a mess of spaghetti that doesn't really read too well is the entire test event for this platform. Uh, this platform, yeah. It, uh, it just shows all the flights layered on top of each other so that you can see the full flight plan of the, of the test event. Um, some of the uh, some of the takeaways I've gotten from working this project that I figure it might be useful for other people, regardless of what they're doing. Um, so the first one I mentioned somewhat earlier, sneaker net. So uh, it, as the as the world is right now, 
Uh, I don't really see that. Oh, sorry. I should probably explain what I mean by sneaker net. So sneaker net is when you have different systems or closed network or a classification, whatever. Sneaker net is whenever a human physically takes that information from that closed network environment, walks it across the street, wherever it needs to go so that it can be uploaded into your environment that you're currently working in. And like I was mentioning earlier, I don't know, I don't see a world where that changes, but it is something to take into account if you're working with information that is on uh, different levels of classification or any, uh, anything like that. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is data format. So if you'll remember, I, I, I had a list of at least four platforms. All those platforms are recording the same information, plus or minus, but they all record it in different ways. And the people who record the information do so differently. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's a reality of the situation that you're going to have to retread some ground when you're working with multiple different organizations. You're going to have to kind of either come to an agreement of a standard practice for formatting, or you're going to have to reformat your uh, raw data anytime it comes in. Uh, next, I'll talk about tool reliability. Uh, this is something that I came up with. Uh, sorry, came in, came in contact with. I didn't come up with it. But uh, uh, sometimes when you're working in a uh, cloud environment and the cloud goes down, um, you don't have access to those tools. And that's just, uh, that's just a reality of the situation. Uh, it just is what it is. And you got to kind of expect for that to happen. That kind of brings me up to my next point of backups. Um, if your network goes down and it's bad enough, uh, hopefully you had some backups with the, so one of my, one of the things I did to uh, kind of limit that is um, uh, there's a GitHub in Vault now so that I can have a, basically a storage for my code that's not on the Plotly servers. So if it happens to have an issue, I still have it, which is nice. Also saving it in a Word document works, but that's a little bit low tech. <laughs> and then finally, uh, classification. And this is really just, uh, it's just the nature of the beast whenever you're working with information. Uh, if you are working on a load side network and you want to bring your code or whatever high, that's a lot of work. It's doable, but it's frustrating. But if you're working on a high side network and you want to bring it down, you are probably, it's a safer bet to just start over. And that's kind of a reality of the situation. Um, on a brighter note, uh, I wanted to talk about kind of like bring it all together. So, uh, like we've been saying this whole conference data is a big deal and there's a lot of it out there and you can't really, if you can't use it, then it's not really worth anything. So the problem is that uh, we, uh, so each of those flights produced about two gigabytes of data and the information I was working with had 21 flights. So I'm sure you all are smart enough to figure out that's a lot of information to deal with. Uh, the solution that I am currently working on with the help of some of my colleagues, coworkers, is to build an environment in which that a lot of this is automated so that the information comes down, it gets processed, and then can be re-uploaded into a environment so that decision makers can see the information faster and without a whole lot of manual in the loop uh, augmentation. And with that, um, I'll open it up to questions. My question. So you mentioned um, in the vault, I think when you showed uh, the clock works, so R, you have R in, in the vault? Do you have one of the yes, uh, it is. Is this kind of like solve the problem too, where I think sometimes like you guys have issues in terms of what software you're allowed to put down onto your last thousand onto your laptop. So basically anybody now can get a web a website and, and can use R in the cloud. Yes, exactly. And that's a that's a great point that I probably should have mentioned. 
Uh, my work computer, uh, it doesn't really have the space to download Python or any of these fancy systems. So what our workaround is that I log into the vault environment and use a, uh, an instance there so that I can work with these sophisticated tools without having to mug down my uh, work computer that's a little bit out of date. I feel like it's, um... Like, how is it speed-wise working with, like, R and Python on the crowd? It's pretty good. Like, I haven't run into any issues. Um, some of the public servers are a little bit slower, but most of the work that I have done has been, uh, I, I I would say it's a pretty good speed. You don't need to, like, so with my cat, I could go log into the you don't need the special. You do have to request access. Yes, it'll. Uh, if you go into the the web page, it'll have uh, what you need to do to request access to this environment. It's something like afdatalab.af.mil. Yes.